Here we go. Episode 13 of Utah in the Weeds. I'm Chris Hollifield. I'm Tim Pickett. And we have a very special guest today, Derek Anderson. It's going to be fun to have him on the show. Talk to him a little bit about cannabis, and, and hopefully uh, we're going to get into the history of cannabis as medicine in the U.S. I got a pretty cool timeline that I've kind of been putting together, Tim, that I'd like to possibly go Oh, yeah. Over. I want to hear. Yeah. And I've been doing a little bit of research to update my you know, my own knowledge this week about the history of the of cannabis in the U.S. But Derek, tell us a little bit about you. Tell us, uh, are, are you a Utah native? Uh, no, I'm a West Coast native. So uh, yeah, uh, Derek Anderson, West Coast native. I was born in Idaho, actually uh, Ashton, Idaho, and I've lived in Washington, Oregon, California is where I graduated high school. And then I've been in Utah since really after high school. So, but uh, definitely West Coast uh, has been my stomping ground for most of my life. Who or what introduced you to cannabis, Derek? I'm kind of always curious of that. Like at what age, if you, if you don't mind talking about that, right? Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm very open. I know high, I mean, high school, I was in Southern California. So it was like, it was available, but I'll straight up say that was, yeah, 99, 2000. So that was like, really like nothing. Well, that's the beginning of uh, medical yeah. cannabis in California. Yeah. Like I think I got medical cannabis a couple of times and most of the time it was probably like Mexican stuff because it just made you sleepy. So THC had turned to CBN. So, I mean, I did that a few times, but I was, yeah, I was Mormon. So I like, I dabbled and I was like, yeah, that was cool. Uh, off to like get, went went on work, the work life and stuff, and then uh, ten or so years later, after a divorce and a head injury involving, well, well, we'll bring it up. Uh, it was involved police officers. Uh, in uh, November of 2010, I got smacked on the head and kind of roughed up pretty hard. Uh, what I'd say, I still feel it right here where the pressure on my chest was put to hold me down. So, same tactics that were used then are being used today. So that people are talking about it. I'm glad because I use cannabis for the pain and to kind of heal my 100% heal my body from that incident that happened. So, and it's been a very, it's been a long journey. It's uh, been, I mean, I do chiropractor, I do float tanks, I do stretching, I do yoga, I do, like I do all that stuff, but cannabis allows me to feel my body. And I can really say allowed me to feel my body right when it happened. Cause I was broken. I weighed 130 pounds. I had to learn how to walk. I had to, it was a pretty rough like it wasn't, no, oh, they didn't beat me. They demolished me. <laughs> like they, and I, yeah, I spent eight days in a hospital induced coma with 22 staples in my head to keep me together. And when I woke up, I remember my th second or third thought when I woke up from like the hospital induced coma was you need to be using cannabis to get better. And so what did, what did the I cops am. even get you for? If you don't mind me asking, I got to find out, man. Like if, especially if they got uh, you that I bad. Was, uh, 100% I held my ground and I was in the, I was having a mental breakdown. Like I was in the middle of a divorce. I'd driven down to California just to kind of get away from stuff. And then they pulled me over and I was like, what you guys now? And I was probably just like being aggravated. And they took that as like, take them down. Oh wow. Get them with hammers. A few months earlier, a guy named Kelly Thomas had actually been killed about 10, 15 miles away from my location. So very similar incident. And I technically was dead at, uh, brain pressure of 88 PSI and, but I survived and I did get people go, Hey, did you go look at pushing tr charges? And yeah, I did went through like three, four lawyers. And because there wasn't enough, uh, there wasn't video evidence, which the video evidence was destroyed or too damaged to be recovered. Hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. And no, nobody would, uh, nobody would touch it. And they didn't, there's nothing on my record because they left me with about a $300,000 hospital bill that I had to declare bankruptcy on. So, wow. yeah, so it wasn't a cheap hospital visit that they left me with. So, wow, this is a crazy story. I mean, I didn't hear this. I mean, we've, we've met each other a couple of other times in Salt Lake at some different events, but, and I, and I knew that you had this, uh, you know, kind of very traumatic injury, uh, that was because you had expressed to me that you're a patient and, um, and that cannabis really helps. Like it's a, key, it's a key thing for you to really get through the day and everything like that. So, yeah. but man, hearing that story, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. You didn't mention PTSD. I mean, that it's helping you with all oh, that. It's been, yeah. It's been triggering. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> Especially <laughs> now. Anyway, sorry. Kind of. No, no. And you're fine. Like the can't breathe part. Like my chiropractor even brought up when I went to him last, like my, where my ribs are, he's like, yeah, where you're bound up, that would be affecting your breathing. I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm aware how it's 
it's definitely like I've I've got some still some healing to do, but the cool thing is the body is capable even after that much damage, it can heal through it. And that's how powerful the endocannabinoid system is. That's definitely my uh what I've learned and uh seen happen just within me and, and other people that I've seen really take the plant on and utilize it correctly. So before this incident with the police. Were you using cannabis at all or just here and there? I, I did do, uh, after my divorce, I jumped on the, well, okay, something's wrong. Uh, what do you guys want me to do? And this is, this is the story. Like got divorced, yeah. went to uh, the, uh, what was the psychiatrist? She gave me a form. I filled it out and they said, cool, here's like Prexa, Xanax, and Paxil. Why they gave me three things right after my brain got broken after my wife left me on no whim. Like I came home to an empty house. That wasn't the best thing. So I went zombie mode for about six months. But the back of my brain, I remember going, this doesn't feel right. And there's something else out there. And I remember, I won't say, uh, I remember being at work. I remember because I was Mormon at the time, nudging one of my guys at work and going, hey, uh, you know anybody that's got any marijuana? This was in like 2009. Starting to kind of like, and they're like, well, what do you need? What do you mean? Are, right. Are you, where are you working at the time? time? <laughs> so I was, I, was, I was a Boy Scout leader going to church at the time. But I knew for a medicine, like I started doing my research and after I read through patents that that government has on cannabinoids, I'm like, no, I know this thing actually is a medicine. Like I ran into a lot of the right things, plus had friends in California from high school who had been growing. So I got to kind of jump into and say, oh, he's using it for ADHD. He's using it for for PTSD. From like, I got to see friends who are using it immediately kind of connect maybe quicker than somebody else would have um, at that time. Oh, wow. And this is all 2009, 2010, 2000. Yeah, right. Right when like dispensaries like were starting to kind of show up in California and kind of like medical had been going on, but we didn't have anything wreck. And it was just medical was kind of the thing that was popping off a little bit. I was just curious. So you were going into the dispensaries early on then in California. So you've actually been able to oh, yeah. really watch the whole medical cannabis from oh, the yeah. ground up, which is really cool in my opinion. Uh, Cause yeah, I, no, I, I got to see, I remember, remember sitting down after getting my medical card and I think it was 2011 sitting down in the dispensary and being like let in one at a time into the back room. And back then it was just jars of wheat. Like <laughs> that's, that's all you, it was just jars of wheat. And then there's like a little bit of like edibles and a few tinctures and like. I've been to a dispensary like that in California, but it was in, within the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, that was. <laughs> That was, I, mean, I remember like Bankers Hill Collective in San Diego and uh, I forget all the different ones I used to go to in SoCal. And, but yeah, no, it was great. I, I would go there. They would have grow, grow classes. I'd go to those and learn how to grow. So yeah, at the very beginning when I, I went down to California and really quickly got into it, not just from medical side, but kind of in, absorbed every bit of it. So Very cool. So fast forward into today. I mean, what are you doing? You've been really involved in the in the whole... Uh, medicalization or medical legalization in Utah. Tell us how, you know, like uh, what your involvement is now. Um, I mean, right now, I mean, my day job uh, might have just changed up a bit. So I'm uh, definitely putting more focus to what is uh, Utah cannabis education and uh, my uh, cannabis consulting. Uh, recently, I helped uh, get what was uh, saltbakecity.com up. If you haven't been to it, check it out. We've got lots of good interviews and good uh, news and local news happening there. But uh yeah, helped get that up. And that's my, my background's IT. I've worked Geek Squad. I've worked uh, anything to kind of do like servers. And and now I'm looking at like can, the can, world of cannabis needs that. And that's kind of what I, I want to help do is like I want everybody to be using their technology the best possible because that to me is what's changed with cannabis in general. Like the lights that I'm used to growing with back 10 years ago is like now you get these LEDs that are like power, like low power, low heat. It's a whole like everything with technology is changing. And that's what I don't think people realize is like the faster you embrace even cannabis and the technology, the faster you're going to see how cool they all kind of come together. So what exactly would you be teaching? You say cannabis education, right? So is this something that like, say my mom would sign up for or something like just some, that will be uh that'll be some of the courses we want to, I, I'm, I've looked at, there's a lot of cannabis education out there, but I want to definitely design more of a, hands-on approach, even a community-based community, community based approach, like, hey, not just are you taking a course, but you're going out to, let's say, one of our local uh, local shops like Moonlight and having to maybe like learn a little bit about the uh, actual, maybe, maybe some of the, maybe some of the things you might be using in a grow or actually like looking at the lights and actually 
learning with that hands-on approach because that's the thing that I've seen like schools just got disrupted and I've been in I've been looking at schools for a while I've never finished college I'm halfway through my cybersecurity degree and kind of always get bored because I'm like I'm learning more online uh what what are you guys what am I paying for and now I'm looking at with cannabis education and stuff like that it's like we do have a big opportunity where people go hey I don't know where to start and I want to give some people some uh some kind of some arenas to start with because I uh, definitely like to gamify stuff. So I'm going to take a lot of what's out there, but uh going to spend the summer uh, building some cool stuff. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very goes. cool. Should we jump into the history of uh, cannabis as medicine here, Tim? Or or I don't know if you had anything Yeah, I mean, more let's talk to, to talk. Derek about it too. Yeah. And, uh, Definite. Oh, yeah. Because I think that uh, tonight we want to do this because really what's going on in the world right now, right? The, yes. There's a... Essentially, you've got this this huge and appropriate political shift, and the the protests and the Black Lives Matter movement, which I, for one, and I, you know, I, I assume we haven't talked about this, but um, I'm going to assume you you two agree with me that this is a really important topic to uh, talk about. And I think with cannabis, it's they're they're really interlaced in a big way. And so there's been a lot more discussion about the legalization of cannabis or the adult use of cannabis or why cannabis was taken away, what, right? Why why it's called marijuana and cannabis, why there's this controversy there, all kinds of things. I have it started back 1937 when they that's when they signed the uh, federal legislation uh, to ban cannabis. So I don't know how far back you wanted to go with that, Tim? I mean, you were talking about even no, what's going I mean, on because I mean, that was a lot of even the reason was a lot of racial reasons. Right. I mean, up until 19, in the mid 1940s, it was in the, from a medical standpoint, it was in what we call the pharmacopoeia, the, the list of known medications. Uh, there was, you know, essentially the book of all the medicines and it was listed in there. And doctors fought to keep it in the the, um, the pharmacopoeia and keep it available for medical use even past the thirty seven, the nineteen thirty seven law. It was, it wasn't taken out until I think the late forties. I have nineteen forty three is when they took it. They removed it from when U.S. formulary and physicians could no longer prescribe it. That was yeah, that was and, the date I pulled out. Yeah. Right. That's it. Yeah. Right there after like the, the World War II, kind of like we had it work. Oh, we wanted it back for a second because we needed hemp. And then we got rid of it real quick. Like it kind of almost came back there into the because there wasn't like because hemp, like it's that they've linked hemp and cannabis so strongly together is like just the ridiculous part because what you're talking about is medical and they've kept an entire industry linked to something also that is a, a medical product from the fiber side. So them to, like it's going to be a while until we even get that mindset broken apart which is kind of happening right now. Right so you're talking about the the economic side of the hemp right and that yeah and I I I see your point like the there is a difference we talk a lot about the history of of essentially the history of marijuana yeah. is what I'm talking about right because well, when I'm, we talk about marijuana we're talking about the drug yep the smoking right? of it compared to the fiber side we brought it back strong, like like the U.S. government was like gave farmers seeds, like we needed to grow because we weren't getting the imports we were getting from uh, Axis members and stuff at the time. And so there was a small bump where it's like we had Hemp for Victory was a video release at that time, and we kind of brought cannabis back. But the minute we got back to it, they're like, nope, push it away. Like that was that. 40 yes, 40. I remember reading that um, where they were issuing tax licenses to yep. grow hemp into the to the uh, mid 20th century right yep and then like, something like that and then the minute the war kind of like the minute like we weren't sure because we didn't know like at one time who knows like stuff was kind of at that time where like they couldn't guess and couldn't wait for imports to come in when we weren't getting it so they're like dude we need you guys to grow this asap so we have this stuff for the war yes i remember when i went to the uh the continuing medical education to become a qmp at uh intermountain Healthcare. They, the pharmacist had gone through their archives and actually found a, a license, like a stamp license from way, way back in their, in their archives. Wow. Uh, uh, old. Stuff's I, I hidden mean, there. You just have to dig it. You got to dig it out. Like they've, they've tried to hide everything, but it's not all hidden. It's, the evidence is there. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Actually, uh, speaking of that, Tim, so when you 
you went to Intermountain Health to get your QMP certification. It was a four hour class you said you had to take. Yes. I mean, who I, taught that class to you? I'm just curious. I don't know if we've ever gotten into it. Oh, that's that. a great, um, since you, yeah, good question. Since you so brought that clinical, up. Yeah. Right. Clinical pharmacists at IHC, uh, they have, they have a physician who, who kind of manages the class and they have, he does a few, uh, sections like of the lecture. And then they have primarily the people who do it is clinical pharmacists. Uh, they do all the research on the studies, what it's good for, what it's bad for, what the, what this data says. And then they present the data, they present the risk, uh, they present the law, uh, and different people take care of the, the discussions about the law. But I did not think, I'll be honest, I didn't think that was the best way to become a QMP. I went there because I wanted to know what IHC culture was surrounding it. So I had already become a QMP in uh, one of the online classes, uh, but I wanted to go there and and kind of get the get more of a sense of what they were all about. And it was about what I what I what I anticipated. It was if you were against cannabis. Here's what I said on this um, to a friend of mine after. If you were against cannabis as a medicine and you went to that uh, CME event, you had a good day. That's that's all I'll say. As far as the way it was presented. Oh, so and, they didn't present it very good then. Well, not <laughs> for somebody like me who's that an advocate, you. right? Like, you know, they're but they're using FDA approved evidence or FDA approved studies. And, and that's when you narrow it down to that type of data. It's, it's easy to make it look scary, dangerous. Um, well, that's discouraging to me, Tim, because that means that the QMPs here are going to have a little bit of that nervous side to them. Being like, well, I don't know if we should use cannabis right now. You know, I don't know. Do you think yeah, that's I the mean, best I guess way so. to teach I, it? It seems like somebody knowledgeable, somebody like a, like, I don't know, yeah, I mean, I shaman think like, or something. You know, <laughs> Derek, uh, you know, Derek's going to have a really a good point of view as far as an educator goes, because he has personal experience with it. Don't you think Derek? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's helped. Like if I hadn't gone through the, like if I hadn't had gone through what I've gone through, it definitely has me not only gone, Hey, I've not only read it, I've seen the actual, what happens when the endocannabinoid system helps you eat, sleep, forget, protect and relax and work in the way that it's supposed to be working. And the clinical evidence is going to be there as we do more studies, but Shoot, we've known since we, I think it was 1975 where they came out says cannabis cures cancer. They didn't know exactly why. And then they shuffled that evidence away real quick. So it's like, we've known and our bodies know, like my body pulled me to it. Like, it's like, you need to be alive. Like, and that's the thing is like being in tune with yourself and stuff like that. People don't realize like we all have that capabilities and it's kind of connected to this cool thing that we've been ignoring for uh, a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yourself. Yeah. It's, and it's crazy. Like, we don't, the doctors don't know about it. I'm like, guys, you really need to like add this to your arsenal because it is a very important system that truly ties us. I mean, animal, the dogs have it and stuff like that, but it's, it's something that's been with us for a while. And when you start, I know when you start working around the plants and everything like that, it makes even more and more sense. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation because I think Derek and I, like what I like about you, Derek is you have got a very, I, I think your view of cannabis is a little different than mine. And this is intriguing to me. What's, di when, what's what, different, we, do you think? We go. Well, I think, you know, you mentioned uh, the endocannabinoid system and doctors and, and you have a, what I hear in your tone is a little skepticism, kind of a built-in skepticism for the, the doctor's system, the, the, the medical system. And I see, uh, but I appreciate that a hundred percent. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think that's good. It's it things I've, I've poked. I've been like, so do you know about the endocannabinoid system? Why not? Why not? That's like, when I go to my doctors, like I ask and I'm, I'm like, why aren't you learning about it? Like, you should be learning about this. This is a, like, yeah, and that's just me. It's like, I'm, I'm very, uh, and I like that. It's like, I like to poke because I'm like new stuff like this is way too important to be ignoring. And I see too many people. No, no, it's cool. It's new. I don't, I don't need to learn about it. I went to school already. And I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> you can't do that. For well, people. see, I mean, I totally agree with that. I totally agree. And I think that, but I'm going to, uh, but I'll turn this around just a little bit. There are things you will say and uh, like, 
there is in 1975, they put out a paper that, uh, that cannabis can cure cancer. And then my, my initial reaction is from medical school is now, wait, Derek, let's hold off. Okay. Let's, before we're make, making a claim that big, let's get the medical, let's get the, the traditional scientific data. So I find myself agreeing with you on one hand and then pushing back on you on another, which I think is the point of this podcast, Chris, if you would agree, is that this is, this is what this is all about. I want to bring all the discussions to the table, man. I want to have all the topics talked about. Yeah, this is one hundred percent. No, there's a I lot. Like that. We're in that we're in that we're in a time period where people are wanting to bring stuff to the table that we've. It stinks when like I wish my incident with the cops had been brought more to the table because I'm like, it happened and it got kind of shuffled and had it been more. It was like, thank goodness I didn't die. Then I don't I don't want to be a martyr for this stuff, but they shouldn't be doing two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of damage to somebody that puts them in a hospital like. That's not something anybody should be doing to anybody. That's bad. <laughs> no. And I, you know, and I, um, and I feel terrible about that for you. And I feel terrible about, like, I was just looking at the Kelly Thomas story, you know, from 2011 that yeah. you mentioned earlier. And, and this is, and, and you're two white guys who got beat up by police and, and, um, I'm not, I don't want to take away from that, but I also want to, I also don't want to say that that's the problem right now. I, no, I think no, no, right now, there, as white know. America, our house isn't on fire, right? Black America's house is on fire. Our house is important, yeah, but no, it's we, not we, on we, fire we, right now. But it's like it's come to the thing where they're on fire and we're like, all right, well, this isn't something we ever brush underneath the rug again. We make us, we help, we no, help. We have got stand up and find an answer for what has not an answer hasn't been found to yet. Like, yeah, like my, me, me, I'm like, I'm glad I'm alive, but I'm seeing the same things that I'm still feeling. I'm like, yeah, this needs to stop. This is ridiculous. Cause I don't want anybody to feel the pain that I felt and others still are. Yeah. I, I, I want to definitely do what I can. And, and, and I think that's what I'm seeing, which I makes me happy that people are finally as one speaking a voice. I'd like to do more through this podcast, Tim. So if you ever have any ideas of things we could do, let me know, buddy. You know, absolutely. You know, uh, I, I'm I'm very interested in that, and uh, and I think you know we're spending the time on the podcast. We we could easily spend some of that time um, helping out or or doing what we can. Absolutely, right? man. Absolutely. So come back to this history. Uh, you know, you have in the 30s, we outlaw it. 40s, it's taken out of the pharmacopoeia. Uh, we, we grow some hemp in the, I think, through, the, through this period, but then we get to Nixon. Yep. Right. And essentially, I mean, are we in agreement that Nixon basically just killed it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that well, 1970 he, when he made it a Schedule One. Or no, that wasn't yeah, Nixon, he, he though, he that type, made it, was it? He kiboshed it harder than just about anyone. Like, that was his. Who's. Yeah. Who's that? Was that Nixon? Yeah, no, it was Nixon. You were dead on with that. 71. He, yep. He launched the war on drugs. Yeah, yep, yep. But this was, uh, and this is how it really ties into racism, uh, is that 30s, the 30s Anslinger, wasn't he a guy who was uh, involved? He was uh, in the government. The head of the DEA and then when stuff, yeah, when, they, when we got done with the prohibition, they flipped all that too. Yep. Uh, okay, so are we going through your timeline, Chris? Yeah, well, we're kind of skipping around a little bit. I mean, we touched. Yeah. I mean, my timeline is, is really simple right now. I want to put more of it together and maybe even talk more on, on other episodes. But I have uh, 1943. That's when they removed it. Uh, physicians could no longer prescribe with it. And then I show 1964. That's when the molecular structure of THC was actually discovered. I Ooh. thought that was kind of cool, you know, to talk about for yeah. My um, uh, doctor, it's M. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, like yeah, an Israeli it, it, doctor. Yeah, Israel. Yeah, because Israel is really they're the guys that uh, hit it first, and even today they're they're just leading in research. And like it says, yeah, like. I bet you the yeah, IHC didn't have any of the research paperwork from Israel because I'm like, they've got stuff. They've got a lot of <laughs> really good research that's, uh, especially on CBD, were some of the first ones to really kind of break down uh, its capabilities. And so, yeah, the research is there. Just, yeah, if you only only look outside of 
only look within, how do you say, somebody who hasn't been looking at cannabis, that's going to be pretty restrictive uh, research that they're looking through. So, Right. So, and then it goes, you see, 1970 is when they, um, let's see, oh, yes. the Controlled so Substance I, Act. Yes. No, in 1970. So I brought up, a, gosh, I brought up an old timeline from a, from a lecture I'm preparing for the PA school. So, uh, yeah, let's, okay, I'm going to take you all the way back to Betsy Ross. We got to mention always Betsy Ross, first American flag made out of hemp fiber. No question. I love, Good old what's Betsy. the movie? Uh, <laughs> I love redheads. Remember that line? It's one of my favorite movies from high school. I'll think of the name of it. What does that um, have to do with Betsy Ross, though, Tim? Uh, no, right? Anyway, <laughs> Betsy Ross, she makes, uh, she makes the flag, but it's a line in the movie. That's how I looked this up. Okay, so anyway, then you go back to yours, 1970. That's when it's taken out of, that's when it's become a Schedule One. No acceptable, acceptable medical use in, 19, in 1970. Which is crazy but essentially because it, was it had banned tons of again. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, did, yeah, for like 12,000 years. Uh, banned again when, like in the 70s? Yeah, 1970s, it was banned again with the label, no accepted medical use. But you, were, but Derek's, uh, to go back to Derek's point, that was in the 40s. The hemp growing uh, was in the 40s when the government was helping farmers grow it. Yeah, we're and, uh, subsidizing. And requ- actually requiring, I think, I forget the exact amount. I remember reading it, reading it somewhere, but yeah, it was requiring it for just a, that small bit when we couldn't get it as an import. Right. And then, and then I'm jumping, right? Well, 73 was the first state to uh, pass cannabis decriminaliz- uh, excuse me, decriminalization. I yes, because an initiative cool. failed the year before in 72, and then in 73, they passed something uh, to legalize it, right? For, for very certain types. But at that point in time... I think there were there's a federal government program after Vietnam to actually supply some of the veterans with marijuana cigarettes. Mm. Um, it wasn't very many though. It was like it was it's a, a handful. Yeah, it was like yeah, it was a pretty small amount. What was the deal with uh, with JFK? Wasn't he using cannabis? Like I don't know at all the whole story off the top of my head, but he was. I heard he was using cannabis and he wanted to legalize cannabis, and then obviously he. Uh, Got shot, you know, or whatnot, you know. So I don't know if either. I mean, are you saying is this is cons- is uh, like a conspiracy theory that he wanted to legalize it and that's why he was assassinated? Oh, no, no, no. Because I'm if not that's say- the case, I'm not saying I'm that. I'm not saying that. I just heard he was using it and that he wanted to legalize it. So I mean, the thing is, is there's been presidents through the years that have been wanting to to legalize cannabis. That's what's crazy about it, man. All the way back to the 60s, 70s. I mean, we're 2020 20, and we still don't even have legal weed. Well, we have met medicinal weed, you know, but right. it looks right. like you but were no. looking something up there, Tim. Yeah, I'm looking it up. I was looking up uh, the JFK thing because they were trying to, I mean, this is just, a, you know, trying to to decide whether or not he actually used it. Oh, so they, they are um, talking about it then? The, the article yeah, I mean, is- it's, yeah, there's some uh, prescription records. You know, Kennedy took some painkillers, anti-anxiety, stimulants, sleeping pills, hormones. Whew. Wow. I mean, if he didn't take cannabis, he probably needed to <laughs> yeah, here, <laughs> with all the meds. This story guy. on uh, JFK uh, from his biography. On the evening of, uh, of July 16, 1962, Jim Troot, Kennedy, and Mary Myers smoked marijuana together. Then the president smoked three of the six joints. Uh, and then uh, basically, then he closed his eyes and refused to fourth join suppose the Russian. So he did like, there's, there's a little excerpt from his biography that JFK did do it. So, I mean, yeah. And then you, uh, if you, if you skip forward, I think it was 1988. Yeah. 1988. I gave a lecture where I remember this quote, the DEA chief, um, he argued about the reclassification because he said, and it's quoted everywhere that uh, marijuana is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. And that's clear back in, in the 80s. And the 80s were the big Reagan years. Nancy Reagan, just say no. You right. Know, you can't and forget that's, her. I mean, did we start the war on no, drugs yeah. then? <laughs> no, it was in the 70s, but he like kind of kept continued. It's like, let's be the generation that doesn't need a joint and doesn't need a Yeah, it's like. Okay, this is come on now. <laughs> right. We're trying to get better now. 
So uh, <laughs> during this whole process, there's people I don't really know a whole lot of like the names and stuff. I've watched the YouTube videos a while back, but there were people getting like tins of uh, pre-rolled joints from the government. You know, yeah, and, I mean like, that's part of that program I was talking okay. about. Yeah, they're like there's that that guy in Florida. I, I'm sure you guys know who I'm talking about. What's his name? Gosh, he just gets a big tin of pre-rolled joints from the government, and then the government's putting, you know, telling us not to use it, putting ads on the TV with fried eggs. You guys remember those commercials? Oh yeah. In fact, I still have a uh, a handout from my elementary or junior high. And I kept it. I don't know why I kept it, but I'm so glad I did. And it has the, this monster on it, and it talks about how all my kids are going to be deformed and dumb, and I can't. I won't be able to remember my own birthday uh, if I, you know, even if I try it. Basically, I think you're talking about Irvin Rosenfield's one of yep. them. I'm actually, looking, yeah, that's probably the guy you're talking about. Yeah, look at that. We need Derek here to look stuff up. You know, hey, look it up. No, Derek, you're Derek, you're our guy. I've, I've got, I'm going through, yeah, I've got, I've got all my cannabis books and art and, and magazines and articles. I, I've got, I've got a decent amount of data from the last 10 years that I've been collecting. So what I thought was really cool though, in 1988 as well, I found out that CBD one and CBD two cannabinoid receptors were discovered. So that was kind of cool. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, it took them what, 30 years to figure out where THC hooked on. Yeah, what it was actually, yeah, where it was interacting in the body, and uh, and even CB three, we've been seeing like it's actually like more like like CB three and CB four receptors that they're actually starting to kind of push into. That's what's cool is like we've known about them, but we're just getting technology is getting good enough to go. That's what they're doing, like to finally get down and see what's going down at those smaller interactions. And but yeah, ninety two was about really the start of us starting to kind of figure this thing out. 92 figuring cannabis out like cb1 cb2 like the actual like technology finally got, it's kind of like the atom it's like we finally got to see the atom and then we kind of like went and looked at the body and we're like oh the body's got this other like the smaller systems and i I've, i already know like the endocannabinoid system is connected to everything and we're just starting to kind of see the webbing of how it really like i was even looking at how like specifically like uh like uh, different things are getting activated and like, yeah, we actually have been growing this plant just for THC for so long. We don't realize what cannabinoids we've lost in the process. The drug war tube losing a lot of cannabinoids. When we bring that back what those interactions will do to the body and stuff. So I'm excited to see what happens when we finally can start growing this thing just like it should be a vegetable. Interesting. Interesting. How uh, do you think, have you seen more minor cannabinoids being grown yeah, now? I'm trying to see uh, like T like seeing THCV come up uh, more, and I I knew that one and actually used that one specifically for my head injury because I kind of actually did a little research and saw it as it's a trisilicic cannabinoid that like attaches better, and now they're actually kind of showing that hey, it helps with like appetite suppression and stuff like that. But for me, I felt it really helped my mind kind of reconnect right after my accident. I ran into about a quarter pound of uh, I think it was Thai skunk, which was really good in THCV for, for the stuff that I got. So it's, it's, uh, I think we, as we explore more and more of the cannabinoids, we're going to discover that we've gotten stuck. I feel like on two when there's truly some magic to happen in some of the other ones. Wow. I'm, I mean, this is all uh, exciting news to me too, because I study up on, or I mean, at least I try to study some up on the, the minor cannabinoids. Cause I think, um, I think that growers are trying to grow some of the minor cannabinoids back into the to the marijuana plant, right? Not just the hemp plant, but like I know that back, the hemp- too hard to THC. And now we're kind of pull back a little bit and see what happens when kind of everything evens out. Cause when you understand the grow process, you can only push so much into one or side or the other. It only has like, you've got CBG turns into THC and CBD. You've only got so much of that to work with before it's going to be maxed out and, and be used up. So yeah, right. Like the same as tomatoes, right? You you exactly. can you can push longevity and you can push shelf life, but you you eliminate other things. You eliminate yep. taste and color or whatever, and now they're just cardboard circles. Yeah, and the on the foot it's, like, it's like I don't want to just get high. I want to like, and that's the thing for healing. If like the the terpenes and stuff like that. Now that people are really looking at, I'm like, that's where I think a lot of the magic's going to happen when people get these really unique terpene profiles grown into their plants and. 
the terpenes, the way that, like B. carophyllene interacts with CB2, it's the, C, uh, the CB2 receptor. So some of these terpenes interact with the receptors too. And people don't really, I think, realize that is a very powerful effect that we still haven't really learned much. We've, we've learned some on, but we've got a lot to learn still. <laughs> So, Chris, wasn't it 96 that California goes well, legal? And that's not yeah. with any knowledge of any cannabinoids. Actually, yeah. 91, I, I found this was interesting. 1991, San Francisco actually became the first city to pass an ordinance in favor of medicinal patients having access to cam- cannabis. So, San Francisco did it in 91. Was it milk? Was it milk that did that one for San Francisco? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I yeah, I can see it. Ninety one to ninety five. There's there's San Francisco and then other cities, and on a physician's recommendation. Now, in this case, I remember um, reading about a physician who in California wasn't. He was recommending cannabis to his patients, but he wasn't keeping any charting, like none. Uh. I, and I think this went on through through the late nineties because. His opinion was, if I keep records, it not only incriminates me, but inc- incriminates my patients if somebody shows up. And so, as a way to protect his patients, actually, he never, never ri- he never wrote down one thing. Uh, he ended up going to prison for for that, but none of his patients got caught. I don't think. Wow, is he still in prison? I don't know. I wish I knew what ended up happening. Is it's one of those uh, you know if you. I don't know how old he was at the time, but I mean, this is the nineties. My, I don't know, probably retired by now. It'd be interesting to track down some of the, the older prison, the people that are in prison for cannabis, you know, related offenses and uh, try to oh, just get yeah. into contact with them. Cause it's gotta be so crappy to be dealt that you know hand anyway. Uh, so yeah, 91 was San Francisco and then 96, uh, that was when the uh, California citizens place on the ballot with a victory of Proposition 215, uh, which legalized medicinal cannabis use, uh, possession and cultivation, which they, they're lucky. Unlike we got here in Utah, they could actually grow it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but they, they had a heck of a ride. I remember watching a lot of that in the beginning of uh, the, the, the medicine or the uh, shops getting raided. And, and uh, it was kind of crazy to oh. watch. Yeah, I remember the shops on TV. Yeah. This is a time in um in history though that that the government and the FBI specifically 93 was Waco. Oh yeah. Right, they were forcing their way into a lot of stuff in the 90s. But the biggest shift with cannabis was really late 90s, early 2000s. That's when a lot of, you know, the, the states were starting to bring uh, medicinal cannabis on board and, and passing that. And then, well, really the last 20 years has been amazing for, right. uh, which, which, what would you say the biggest reason for that is? Is that more because we have access to the internet and stuff like that? So people have access to information? I think access to the information I'd say is huge. I even when I was looking, I had to hunt in 2010. Like it wasn't readily available. Like you had to kind of poke around and look through patents uh, and research papers. If you wanted like kind of research, it wasn't readily available stuff. You could go buy some books, but the internet, I think is like, you can't hide the information anymore. That's what they did. That's what Nixon did is he went out to the colleges and destroyed the information. Like they wiped they wiped anything that was like they 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 sent groups out and wiped stuff out and you can't do that with internet age like you can't yeah. you can't you can't you can't you can't stop the uh, global information and people showing exactly what's happening because that's what we don't realize we lived in a world before that ha- that happened and then 1989 happened and DARPA and the internet and everything starts firing up and it wasn't until 2000 i was helping people get ready for y2k people were so scared of computers <laughs> after y2k happened that we finally got oh okay they're not they're not gonna bite me okay i can get on this computer and then boom like people started getting into it and i remember selling 2005 selling women computers to play world of warcraft on i'm like what the crap's going on like the change that happened very quickly with computers is yeah been 20 years right on the dot of just about so yeah, and I think we're we're forgetting one thing, and that is the pharmaceutical industry. Remember, the pharmaceutical industry helped Nixon make that change, 
And in the nineties, I think it was in the nineties, we got a, I mean, the best way to sell a product is to get a, a symptom. Like when you're a drug maker, you need to get a symptom. And what they did with the, with the pharmaceutical industry is they made the sixth vital sign be pain. And we were taught about the sixth vital sign of pain and how to treat it with a product that was sold to us by the pharmaceutical industry or given to us, you know, with free trips to free trips to places and all kinds of stuff in the medical community. So I think they're the next step and they kept other information down as well. Oh, and yeah. now this is just too big of a, it's too big of a um, movement now. So I, I think it's all these things combined, Chris. I think distrust of government um, has played a pretty big role in in this. I think the pharmaceutical industry and killing 200,000 plus people with opioids has played a huge role in addicting the world to these pharmaceutical. I mean, I think, gosh, I mean, the world is just fed up with that. Now we just got to legalize it, decriminalize it, something, you know, I think, uh, I've, I've always said, you got to teach, you got to teach first and then we can decide, we can decide what to do when everybody's educated about it and we can make an informed decision. I'm not, I just, I'm not sure we're there yet. Oh, come on, Tim. We're there, I buddy. I mean, I'm an, I'm an adult. I should be able to make my own decisions. So, you know, I'm good with that. So, and well, then back to the timeline, there was a couple more dates I wanted to mention that were kind of big dates. Uh, 2014, that was the legalization of uh, medical CBD in a boatload of states, including Utah. I don't know if you guys remember that whole ordeal. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, pretty- I remember talking to Rich Oborn about that. Yeah. Now, that was a pretty big deal here in Utah. It's like, ooh, we have legal CBD. We thought we were... We thought we were living on the edge. <laughs> At least I did. I was like, wow, Utah, what are you doing? Yeah, I remember that. And uh, yeah, so that, that was nice. It was uh, uh, one, some hemp shop that was in Sugar House. I remember going and buying uh, some CBD drops from them back in like yeah, 2014, 2015, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was just getting out of PA school and I was, I remember thinking, gosh, we're in the next few years, we're going to see so many medications with CBD and a bunch of stuff. I mean, it's, it's panned out a little bit, but. But definitely, again, I, I mean, I think part of this is the pharmaceutical industry's ability to keep these things from coming to market in a big way. But, yep. you know, we haven't seen as many uh, CBD drugs approved as I thought we would. What do you think that is, Derek? Do you think that's partly because you need the whole plant? I mean, that's kind of what I think. They're, they're like, and I can say this, even that CBD I got back in 2014, 2015, it was effective for about a month, month and a half, like just pure CBD isolate. And then my body is like, cool, not doing much anymore. You That full spectrum, when you have the full plant, that's that's how you have to take this thing. And that's too many people want to break it up. They want to be able to monopolize like that one cannabinoid. I'm like, you're not going to be able to do that, guys. Like, it doesn't work like that with this plant. It's like, because you when, when you actually like, even like, the plants, when I see people taking the plants and smashing them, I'm like, ah, don't do that because of the way you understand the trichromes and the terpenes and the way that all that structure is, is like, really, you want that all together. I mean, smashing, that's destroying the medicine in a sense. And and it's uh, like, especially with extraction processes and stuff like that, there's tons of ways to do it. But I definitely know like, yeah, it's always going to be the full plant. That's going to, when we start treating it like a vegetable, it's like, hey, which vegetables did you take today from the cannabis family? That's what I want to be hearing more of than, than anything than like I took, I mean, taking, uh, uh, taking it at all is good for everybody, but yeah, full, full plant all, all day long. I was just looking at the dates here, seeing if there was any more, uh, prominent ones. And then well, 2018, that's when uh, legalization like that. Well, that's true. When I saw the, when I saw stuff start clicking, like the change was right after Colorado and Washington flipped it. Yeah. To, uh, to adult use. Yeah. Yeah, when they, when they did that, that's when we got the the steamroller started pushing like hard. My question about okay, so Washington and Colorado. I mean, this is this is eight years ago that they yep. legalized recreational marijuana. Enough time for us to look at them and see how they're, you know, has a state gone to uh, gone to hell basically? And I don't. I mean, I think they're doing great. So why haven't all the states legalized? You know, that's what I don't understand. 
I mean, and they're having their hiccups, like increase in high housing prices. I think that's the biggest thing has been increase. Like, but we're having yeah, everybody problem. wants to live so, there. California is having the problem. So it's like, well, that's happening everywhere. So that's not really a problem. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's just why hasn't everybody flipped it? I'm like, not all the states are ready for it. And until we can start doing inter, like, we need to get it off the schedule one. Like, that's the problem. It's like, you can't do interstate. We can't do like interstate commerce with the plant. Like the best place to grow really the medical marijuana stuff is going to be like on the West coast near the ocean. Like it's just better weather. They've got longer light cycles, but hemp, we're going to be the best of the best growing it out here, but we can't even trade. We can't pass back and forth. It's, it's hampered right now. And that's why it hasn't fully turned on is like until we can get it where all the States can start using it. One state turns on, they've got their own rules. This state turns on, they've got their own rules. Then they're like, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of almost uh, controlled chaos as far as everybody flipping it all at once and trying to figure it out while it's still illegal federally. Right. You're, you're saying you, you've got to decriminalize it federally for the next step. That's really, I mean, that's what I would say, Chris, is the next step. It's got to be yeah, yeah, decriminalize it federally. You can study it. You can interstate commerce it. And then, yeah, I mean, I'm a medical guy, right? So I like I like the medical thing, but- I've told you before, I think that's because I want the medical profession to really buy into it. I think if you legalize it for adult use too early, then the medical community doesn't get a handle on uh, its legitimacy quick enough and patients end up suffering because it it delays the availability of it as as a real medication. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, torn. I, I agree. I agree with you on that one part. Like when you go wreck, like we needed to go wreck to fire it off, but I'm very much someone who uses it medical. It's like, I've been around too many of the stoner, stoner bros. And I'm like, guys, I, yeah, it's like it, it, the one thing they're like, Derek, do you ever get high? I'm like, no, I'm using this for pain. Like you guys go get high off your dabs and stuff. I'm going to go to work. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's <laughs> What's like your question, point. Chris? Well, no, no, no. I was just going to ask you, Tim, you were saying you were waiting for the medical side to catch up or to, to kind of investigate it first, but they're so slow, man. Like they're nah, so skeptical is, uh, and slow that the rest of the world know, is just going to say, Hey, go look on the internet, dude. Don't be dumb. Just let's yeah, just Yeah, I mean this is this is the other argument, right? Is to let the let the masses have it, let them have access to it, let us grow it, let everybody just do what they're going to do and then take all that data, feed it into the uh the AI and then let the AI decide what's good and what's bad. And that's uh I mean I guess that's that's a a way to go. I mean there's all these options. I I get to have a voice, but I don't get to make the final decision. And I'm torn, Chris. I'm torn because no, I, I know I what it's it. like to go to Vegas, go to Colorado and and have recreational or or what I liked Sean Hammond's uh point about calling it adult use and being being able to access it like that. And I like, I like that. the advantages of the of the medical program here. Yeah. Uh you know, I I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna end up. I just think the medical side needs to get fast and start catching up and start doing some studies, start doing some research, start putting it out there, start letting more patients use it, start making it more accessible and uh, start having more flour in our pharmacies here in Utah. Oh my gosh. Is it just, it's terrible. I got, (laughs) I did get a report, Derek. I don't know if you, uh, you've kind of followed this, but there's 4,200, 4,300 legal card holders in Utah. There is, uh, you know, a lot more letter holders than that. And they're accessing the system. And there are literally three small dispensaries that are open for all of these patients. It's just not enough. No, I mean, this time of year, I'll, I'll, I'll throw down some knowledge that I know, because even in Northern California right now, like it was, uh, this is just the time of year where it's just dry. Like this is kind of like the, the grow season, like we're actually like, as far as it's just dry across the board. But what really happened in California that changed up a lot of the market was they changed up where a lot of farmers got out early last year. So a lot of stuff kind of confluxed. But when I went out there, I went and got two king size joints that were cropped out from November 2018. I slept really good because they were older stuff. But even out in California in their top level dispensaries, they had older stuff. So 
it's interesting. Like the whole, it's like everything's kind of in conflict. It's not just here in Utah, but I can say no, nobody in cannabis right now with everything that's going on has, I mean, people, of course, that are their own growers and stuff like that probably have awesome selection, but it's probably a little scrappy across the board. So I feel like here, just like, but I can say this, four years ago when I went out there, it was worse. I had my medical marijuana card. I went to Eureka, California. I had to hunt down one dispensary that had a very tiny selection of flour. Like it was, I was in Northern California where it should have been all over the place. So I can say whenever programs just get started, it does say, take a second, but we were right. We told them they wouldn't have enough growers. We told them they wouldn't have enough dispensary. Like we told all the state people, all this stuff. It's like, they shouldn't have gotten involved. They should have let us do prop two and should have gotten out of the way and let us do it. But they had to get involved and they are failing. So I'm going to call on it. Like, Hey, you guys got in the way and you are, don't have enough flour for our patients. You failed. You're not following through on what you said you guys were going to do. Drop to this HSB, like get a, give us back prop two and get out of the way. Thank you. So that's just. <laughs> that's your two bits. I like to hear it. Two bits. Like, I'm like, you, you guys, we called you on it. You're doing exactly what we told you were going to do. I did want to mention a tip though, that I've learned is if you sign up for the dragonfly newsletter, you'll get a, like a, a email telling you when they get some flour in. So like yesterday, they oh, actually yeah. did get some flour in. Uh, in an email and I'm sure it was sold out within an hour. Yeah, so, I got a, uh, I got an email from a patient of mine, uh, yesterday afternoon that was like, Oh wow, this process is slow. They were at Dragonfly all, all afternoon to try to get some flour. But you know what? That I, it's, I'm, it's how it's like you're saying, it's it how it starts. Yep. And if we ask the state and if we complain to the state, they're going to say, hey, hang on. There's there's growers who haven't got flour into the shops yet. There's shops that haven't opened. Just give it a while and be patient. And uh, patience, yeah. be patient. <laughs> yeah, patience, please be patient. You waited 20 years for this anyway, right? So what's another few months, Chris? Hey, Tim. So I got a question actually for you. I, I was talking to a buddy the other day about the letters thing in the uh, medical card. Um, yeah, I figured this is a perfect opportunity to bring it up because this, I'm sure yeah, other absolutely. people are. So if somebody goes and gets their letter from a doctor, they could take it to like, say dragonfly and purchase a product there, but they're yes. only allowed to go to that one dispensary slash pharmacy. That's correct. The state set up a system where you can register your letter with one dispensary. Once you choose a dispensary, you can't, you cannot go anywhere else. Unless you go get your actual registered state card. But that's that was a, kind of my question is they were asking, they were like, well, can I use my letter, say, till September? And then if I want to go decide, well, I like this. And then I want to go register with the state. Does that make yeah, sense? But, I'm like, well, yeah, that's kind of weird, yeah. but. Well, and yes, I mean, technically, yes. But remember the provider, there's two things I want to say about this. One, when you go to Dragonfly with your letter, the Dragonfly calls or, or makes, makes contact with the, the provider that you went to see and will verify that that letter is legit, right? That's why it takes a while to register with Dragonfly, get in there. So your provider can shut that letter off at any moment, right? They can call Dragonfly and say, hey, Derek's letter's no good. He hasn't seen me in six months. That's the law. He needs to come in. He needs to see me because I can't, I can't in good conscience recommend this medication if I'm not seeing my patient. And that's the thing that's the second point, which is in September, you know, say I got a letter in February, or maybe even I got a letter last year by, by, by me. And, you know, it's been 10 months. Well, yeah, that letter, when you go to register, it's the same process as registering a brand new card. You go in, you register, and the QMP has to go in and do the certification. Well, that QMP is likely going to say, if they know the law, uh, they're going to say, "Hey, wait, you you got to come into the office. I mean, you got to see me. You know, that's the that's how the law works." So there are thousands of letters that are out there um, that we know of and that have been registered at the dispensaries. There is going to be a huge number of cards issued in November and December. Um, but when those people are like, Hey, you know what? This letter has been good. It's kept me legal. It's kept me out of jail, but man, I got to get my card. 
But my We're question, how expire. are they going to even know that, though? Because, like, say, let's say I took my letter in. I'm not going to be reminded of that. I'm going to kind of forget and be like, oh, I can keep going to Dragonfly. I don't know. They're, no one's going to notify him, are they? No. I mean, the QMPs, there are 300 and, uh, 350-odd uh, QMPs now in Utah. And those QMPs, most of them aren't doing what, what like, I'm doing uh, which is, you know, trying to like, like a podcast, of course, anybody who listens here, or anybody who uh, talks to Derek or uh, as part of his education series is going to know, right? Because part of that education in Utah is going to be, Hey, Hey guys and gals, this is, this is going to like, it's going to blow up and we got to get our registration done. Um, so really it's not going to be anything but paying attention. You're right. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be uh, at least hundreds, if not thousands of people who January 1st go into Dragonfly and it's just going to be like in the beginning. Sorry, your letter's no good here. You've got to go to your QMP and it's going to be a start over process. Hopefully, Derek, I, you, Chris, you know, together, the three of us can educate everybody in the state. And got, way to lay it all on us, Tim. Thank you. Thank you know, you. that's a lot of pressure, buddy. <laughs> Oh man, oh, we've man. got a lot of work to do. Yeah, let's uh let's wrap this episode up, man. Let's uh I mean, I know we could probably talk more about history of uh cannabis and whatnot, but we're already going over an hour here and that's a lot of a lot of podcast editing for me. So I don't want to do all Yeah, that. I get but, it. But uh unless now there's more you unless there's more you want to talk about, Tim. Uh uh-huh, I'm good. I'm I'm happy. Derek, uh how can people find you, Derek? You know, where where are you at? Uh, I mean, uh, Utah Cannabis Education is my handle, one of my handles on Instagram and uh, Facebook. Uh, definitely uh, follow me there. And uh, that's uh, probably one of the best places to reach out. I'll be putting a lot of stuff up on that and hitting up the farms and uh, showing what's going on here in Utah with cannabis and uh, educating. So uh, you can get a hold of me at utahmarijuana.org if you wanted to know. That's the easiest place to find me. They can listen to the podcast there. You got transcripts yes. of the podcast. You got information yes, on how to up. get your medical card there. Boom. All kinds you of stuff. You can find out all kinds of stuff. In fact, I should probably have Derek help me with some of the educational pieces to add to it. Most definitely. <laughs> We're putting out some condition pages right now for different conditions, uh, really streamlining the process to find out about how to get your medical card. And we do a lot. Right now, we do a lot of education on navigating that process. Um, like the click by click navigating, registering for your card, because there are a lot of people in need of that. But anyway, that's me. Chris, how can people, I mean, really, you're the you're the uh, the heart and soul of this thing. Well, so yeah, you can find me at IamSaltLake.com. That's my other podcast, my other project. I do that with my wife, uh, last week we had the owner of, uh, twist downtown, the bar and, uh, restaurant down there. I don't know if you've ever been there before, Tim. Uh, they were just oh, kind of yeah. talking about all the different things they had to go through with the coronavirus having to shut down and all that. And now reopening. So that was an interesting conversation that we had with it, with him. So good. I'm going to take a listen. I am salt lake.com is that. And, um, yeah, on that note, make sure to subscribe to this podcast. And uh, there was actually a new review. I should have had that pulled up on iTunes. Next week, we'll read it, Tim. So hopefully I'll- Okay, awesome. And uh, other than that, you guys have a great week. Thanks, Derek, for coming on the show, buddy. Uh, Thanks for having me, guys.